فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحوم كالطير تحلق في الثقافات وتنهل من روب الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household, all his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us And to grant us all goodness And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings And may he grant us paradise, Amin. My brothers and sisters, we are speaking about the ayat, the ayat, the verses and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every verse in the Quran is actually a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is in fact the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you were to look closely at any one of the verses in the Quran, you would notice that it has in it the power of divinity. It is divine. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no error in it. Linguistically, it is absolutely accurate. So this is part of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is indeed that which is the most valuable ever. I'm not going to go into the meanings of the term ayat because I'd like to move on to the specific topic that I have this evening. And that is, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him. You and I know that in the Quran, the story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam is repeated the most, more than any other messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this story is only repeated because of its importance. Because there are lessons that we derive from the story. Remember, my brothers and sisters, whenever we have a story that is mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is not there for nothing. It is not there for no reason. There is definitely a reason. There are definitely lessons that we need to derive from that beautiful story. Not just one, but so many. It definitely affects us. It applies within our lives in so many different ways. Sometimes we don't know. We just read them as bedtime stories. You know, they say Noah had an ark, may peace be upon him. And he took in the animals. They went in two by two and so on. And we make it into a little story. And the children say, wow. Even the adults, they say, oh, that must have been interesting, you know. But they don't realize what is the lesson. Every messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was sent with the primary message that is the same. You know when they say the messengers all brought the same message? Some children ask, well why don't the Christians fulfill the five salah the way we do? If all the messengers brought the same message, why is halal and haram different from Judaism and Islam? The, the reason is you haven't understood the meaning of the same message. When it comes to aqidah and belief, they all brought the same message. When it comes to the details of how to live or jurisprudence or the sharia, it differed with the differing of time, with the changing of time, such that at the moment the sharia that we have of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the only one that is actually applicable right to the end of time. This is the beauty of the final sharia. But when it comes to belief, Amantu billahi, all the messengers taught that. Wa malaikatihi, wa kutubihi, wa rusulihi, wal yawmil akhir, wal qadar, hulwihi wa murrih, o khayrihi wa sharrih, min Allah, wal ba'thi ba'd al maut. All of that is included in the pillars of Iman. The messengers all taught exactly the same. So all these messengers came in and they said, Worship Allah alone. Worship Allah alone. You have no deity besides Allah. There is no one other than Allah who will help you, who is your maker, who is owed worship, whom you shall return to. It is only your maker. May Allah make it easy for every one of us. So this is why we say the primary message was always the same. Exactly identical. Musa alayhi salatu was salam was sent at a time when there was great difficulty and hardship. What was the hardship? This man, the Pharaoh, the Fir'aun, remember there were so many Pharaohs, just like the term Najashi, you know, we've heard about Najashi, the Negus of Abyssinia. 
The term Najashi refers to any ruler of Abyssinia. There were so many Najashis. But the one whom Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu spoke to, according to the narrations, his name was Ashama. Ashama. The same applies when it comes to Fir'aun. When you say Pharaoh, there was this Pharaoh and that Pharaoh and the other, so many Pharaohs. It was the title given to the one who ruled at that time, that particular civilization within what we know today as Egypt. But at the same time, who, who exactly was he? Some say he was Ramses II. Some have other opinions. That's besides the point. The real point is he was a tyrant. The particular man we're talking about, he was a human being. He knew he was a human being. But because he had lots of money, because he had lots of wealth, so to speak, and he had lots of power, he called himself a god. وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأُ مَا عَلِمْتُ لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْرِي Fir'aun told his cronies, you know, the people who were close to him, the chiefs, the ministers, those with power, a little bit of power, whom he had given to. He told them, I don't know of another God for you guys besides me. I'm the God. They knew that he also visits the toilet so many times a day. They knew that. But, yeah, 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 you're the God. Why? Money, money. Everyone wants to worship money and power. A man who has power. Wallahi, I recall something very strange. One driver who had driven me recently in a vehicle that was totally tinted, completely tinted. He told me, you know, this car, it's more powerful than a human being. I told him, what do you mean? He says, when we, when we drive, when I'm alone in the car, people wave at the car. I was like, what? He says, yeah, they salute. Even the policemen, subhanallah, they see this vehicle with such a number plate, such a posh car. They just look at it, they salute and they let you move through. They don't even know what's going on. Why? It's wealth. That's what it is. It's power. It depicts power, doesn't it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We learn a lesson that it has nothing to do with your money. It has nothing to do with your power. It has to do with your closeness to the one who made you. That's what it is. That's primary lesson. Number one that we learn from the story of the Pharaoh. It's nothing to do with his power. It's nothing to do with his status that he had on earth. It's nothing to do with his wealth. It is to do with how close you are to Allah. How many of us, we don't have much. People love us because we serve them and we serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many of us, we have a lot. No one wants to even talk to us. How many of us, we have authority. People hate us. They only like us because we're in authority while we were in authority so that they protect themselves from harm. One of the signs of the hour is an yukram ar-rajulu makhafata sharrihi. You know what that means? A person will be honored, not because he's worth the honor, but because we fear that he might harm us. So we say, hello, sir. How are you? I don't even want to greet you, man. The only reason is you're in a little bit of power. If I don't greet you, there might be a bit of a problem. So how are you? I invite you to my function. I do this. I do that. Not because I want you to be there. It's a sign of the hour that people will be honored, not because they deserve honor, just because they are capable of a lot of evil if they were not given that make or that makeshift honor. Should I say that honor which is fake? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. The Pharaoh... That's how he was. That's how he was. He knew he's not a God. He knew it very well. But he used to say he is. One day a fortune teller told him, it's a long story, I'm cutting it short. Fortune teller told him, you know what? Your power is going to go. Your wealth is going to go. A man from these people. Who are these people? Banu Israel. The, who are the Banu Israel? They are the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. Yaqub alayhi salam, the prophet Jacob, may peace be upon him. He was known as Israel as well. And the, his children were known as Banu Israel, the children of Yaqub. And subhanallah, he had 12 sons and those were the leaders of the 12 different tribes. The 12 different tribes. Now, remember, it was the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fir'aun was there. The people of Israel, the children of, the, meaning the, the progeny, the offspring of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, they were oppressed. And they were oppressed in a way that their land was usurped from them. And at the same time, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, was to be sent by Allah in a unique way. What was that unique way? This fortune teller says, someone is going to come and he's going to upseat you. He's going to uproot your entire dynasty. How can that happen? I'm a powerful man. I need to sort it out. He says, well, he's going to be born one of the years, you know, the odd years. 
He says, I'll kill all of them. I'll kill all of their children. So according to the narrations, he used to, in fact, according to verses of the Quran, you know, Fir'aun, he used to think he was high on earth. What did he used to do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلَ أَهْلَ أَشْيَاءٍ يَسْتَضْعِفُ طَائِفَةً مِّنْهُمْ يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيِي نِسَاءَهُمْ He had created division amongst his people. You know the divide and rule policy? He had lifted some, he had brought close those who supported him, he threw back some just because they didn't consider him a god, etc. And he used to leave the females and he used to kill the male child. As soon as you're born, female, leave you. Male, you are going to threaten my position. So I don't need you here. Since I have the authority to eradicate you at birth, I eradicate. Astaghfirullah. This was the man. If he was a god, they wouldn't have been born. He would have been in control and in charge. But he was not the creator. He knew it. He had to kill after they were born, created by the real God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's reported that every second year, he decided to do this and he was doing it. Moses, may peace be upon him, was born the year that they were killing the children. So the mother was very, 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 very saddened. And they kept him a big secret. And they kept him closed and they were worried because they would take him as soon as they knew he was born or some child was born from amongst Banu Israel and what would happen? They would kill him. That's it. Ruthless, brutal. Brothers and sisters, another lesson we learn. When Allah wants you to get something, to achieve something or to give you something, nobody can stop it. Even if the whole world is trying to block you from achieving something, they won't be able to do it. If the whole nation gets together to benefit you, they won't be able to benefit you except with that which Allah has written for you. And the opposite also is in the same hadith. The Prophet Muhammad is telling us that if the entire ummah, the whole nation gets together to harm you, they will never be able to inflict any harm upon you unless Allah has written it against you. If Allah has written it against you, you need to know nothing is going to stop it. May Allah protect us all. Look at this man, young baby, born, Fir'aun, looking, searching. His men were everywhere. They were spies all over. They didn't hear, they didn't witness, they didn't see. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired his mother to do something unique. To put him into a little casket or a basket and to put him or literally to cast him into the Nile, into the river. Cast him into the river. How can I do that? Don't worry. The one who made him will look after him. Subhanallah. The one who made him will look after him. Allah says, Alqihi fil yammi wa la takhafi wa la tahzani inna raadduhu ilayki wa ja'iluhu min al-mursaleen. Instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take him and place him in the water, in the river. Allah will return him to you. Allah says, we will return him to you. Subhanallah. And we will make him from amongst those who is sent. We will make him a messenger. He's going to have something big. Subhanallah. And what happened? Allah did not bless the Pharaoh with children. They were looking for this male child. And the wife, as she was walking, she notices this little casket and she picks up this baby. And the baby was absolutely gorgeous, absolutely innocent, totally. And cut a long story short, they looked after Musa alayhi salatu was salam until he grew quite old. He was not suckling from anyone because that was the plan of Allah. And they were desperate to get him to suckle because he needed to survive until subhanallah. Subhanallah. Amazingly, 
Allah returned the baby as a baby, as an infant to the mother. He would be brought in the highest form of luxury. He would be brought to the mother. The mother would suckle, spend some time, etc., etc., look after him, breastfeed him, whatever else, and send him back. And he suckled from no one else. This is the power of Allah. Never underestimate the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he wants to give you, he will give you. Pray to him. Pray hard. Pray with conviction. When the time is right, what you want will come to you. Remember that. If it is good for you, and if, Allah, if it is meant for you, it's in coming in your direction. If it is not, no matter what, it won't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ We returned him to his mother in order for her eyes to be cooled and for, that, and for her not to be saddened. She was a good woman. She was close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was chosen to be the mother of a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine what qualities she had. I always tell the sisters and even the brothers that if you want a child who's going to be someone serving the deen, ask yourself, who am I to start with? Who am I to start with? If I'm a person who wants to follow the trends of today and I have my little heels and my makeup and my miniskirt and I'm walking around with a little handbag, throwing things behind my back like this, do you want a child who's going to really be some form of you know, service to the deen? The same applies to the brothers. Every night you're in the club, you know, jumping and dancing and drinking and everything else and womanizing and all of those nature of, of things, you know, that type of thing. And then you say, oh Allah, Make my child a brig, you know, sheikh who's going to be spreading the deen. <laughs> Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Your sheikh is in the nightclub. That's what it is. And you want your child to be the sheikh spreading the deen. You know, Allah can do it. But you need to repent. You need to turn back. It's never too late. My brothers and sisters, we turn to Allah. We turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not too late. We're breathing. Take a look at the world. Learn by looking at the globe. Watch the people. See the most content people are not those who run behind materialistic items. Remember that. Wallahi, I promise you. Yes, you might look at glamour. You might look at popularity. You might look at someone who the world looks at as, wow, a superhero, you know, a heroine. Someone who's a movie star in real life. They are depressed. They are struggling. They, are, they have addiction sometimes to various things, even drugs. They suffer with problems. They are bipolar. Look at so many of these pop stars popping one after the other. Pop, 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 pop. Have you seen that? That's why they're called pop stars. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, we need to serve the ummah. We need to have a concern for the next generations. We need to serve Allah so that at least in our progeny, when they watch us, do you know the most powerful way of relaying the message is for them to follow by example, when you are fulfilling salah, when you dress in a specific way, your child who cannot yet speak in your language, who cannot yet communicate properly in your own system, will fight to dress the way you dress. Just because that is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you fulfill your salah constantly, your child will be found in sujood before they can even walk. Do you know that? Why? Did you talk to them? No, it was Allah's way of telling you, look, if you are good, inshallah, by the will of Allah, they will have a good upbringing. What they do beyond a certain age becomes between them and Allah. Once you arrive at a certain point, it's now your life. I looked after my children up to a certain age. An example, just an example. I'm not talking about myself, but I'm saying, if I look after my children for a certain age, up to a certain age, beyond that, if they end up dwindling left and right, I can always say, Ya Allah, I offered them the best. I still make dua for them. I will still guide them. But now they're independent. They are doing things. It's up to them now. It's between you and them. Ya Allah, guide them. Subhanallah. I can try when I say I can guide them and Allah guides them. Two different types of guidance. One is, one is to show them the way. I can show them the way to say, look, this is the way. But a tawfiq is from Allah. The guidance in the sense that to bring them onto the path is from Allah. May Allah bring our children on the path. And before that, may Allah bring us on the path and keep us steadfast. Remember, when you follow your faith, considering it an honor to follow your faith, that is when you have achieved something. 
But when you follow your faith, considering it a burden, yes, you may be following, but you will not achieve the true benefit of the entire package. People fulfill salah. When you fulfill salah, you're lazy to do it. You're just doing it because, hey, you know what? I'm scared. I don't want to be punished. Okay, fair enough. Your salah may be done. But if you want to achieve the broader benefits of that beautiful salah, do it as an honor. Oh Allah, I love you. I'm going to fulfill this salah because I want to do it for your sake. You've given me so much, ya Allah. Amazing. My brothers and sisters, getting back to the Pharaoh, Musa alayhi salatu was salam brought up in this home. Going back to his mother, I want to draw another lesson for us all. Sometimes we are separated from our loved ones. Agree? Whether it's your child after a divorce, whether it is someone prior to divorce, maybe your husband had to go and work somewhere, maybe you had to go somewhere, maybe something happened, you were separated for some reason. Sometimes the separation is caused by a third party intentionally. The story of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, the lessons, the ayat, the ibrah, you know, the, the lessons we learn, it consoles those who are separated from their loved ones, saying, Inna raddu ilayk, we will definitely return him to you. If Musa alayhi salam's mother was told that by Allah, I'm sure Allah can return to us our loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us with our loved ones. Sometimes we are separated through death. Do you know that? Death has separated me from my loved one, for example. Or a child or a parent or a brother, a sibling, someone you really care for, you really love. Don't worry. Allah speaks about how He will allow your family members to join you in the hereafter on condition that you all believed. On condition that you all believed. You need to try to earn the pleasure of Allah. You did it. Your children did it. You tried your best. Allah says, we will gather you together. Don't worry. You're going to be united. When you lose a loved one through death, it's not the end of the path. By the will of Allah, you will meet them again very soon. A matter of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. And may we meet them in a better place. Not in a worse place. You know, it reminds me of those... Every little while they say, this man is a kafir. That one is a kafir. This one is a kafir. You know, some people have this disease. They think it's part of Islam to just call the rest of the Muslims kuffar. So they say, this one is going to Jahannam. That one is Jahannam. My brother, who's left? I think when you go, it's just going to be you. Subhanallah. But I learned a new one. I said, brother, how do you know they're all in Jahannam? Were you there before them waiting to welcome them? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. Be careful of your tongue. This tongue can take you to Jannah or it can drop you down all the way to hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. The Fir'aun, what was he doing? He was loud mouth. He used to talk a lot. I am the God. I am the one. You know, Musa alayhi salatu was salam. There came a stage when he grew a little bit older and there was an incident where he fisted. He actually hit someone with one fist. And you know what happened? The man died. It was a mistake. It was an error. He did not intend to do that. Allah says, فَوَكَزَهُ مُوسَىٰ فَقَضَىٰ عَلَيْهِ قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ As soon as Musa alayhi salam gave him one shot, the man was dead. Imagine how powerful he was. Musa alayhi salatu was salam. They say he was big, well-built and dark in complexion. Subhanallah. So much for those who want to be light in complexion. MashaAllah. I spoke about it yesterday. That's why I'm saying it again. We have a disease where we become people who don't like those who are slightly darker. A'udhu billah. Sometimes the best from amongst us are the darkest. Remember that. And sometimes, may Allah forgive us, the worst from amongst us could be the opposite. But there is no hard and fast rule. It's got to do with the heart. Whether you're dark or light means nothing to Allah. It was just a test for you. That's what it is. It was a test for you. So Musa alayhi salatu was salam, that was his description according to some of the narrations. And you know what? When he punched this man, the man died immediately. He says, Hada min amal shaytan. This is from the handiwork of the devil. How many of us, when we commit a sin, 
we, we admit that this is bad and this is from the handiwork of the devil. Sometimes we commit a sin and astaghfirullah, we're planning to commit another one because we enjoyed the previous one. That's what happens. When it comes to adultery, fornication, may Allah protect us all. We are living in an age where everything is about sex. You know that. Everything around us, the phone, the whatever else, the way the dressing has been promoted and the adverts, the media, everything. So we need to protect ourselves for the sake of Allah. Because if you follow that path, your contentment is snatched. You will not be a happy person. What is the point of being happy for half an hour? You know, 45 minutes, you're excited, you're happy, maybe even less than that. And after that, you're worried. What are you worried about? So many different things. I don't need to get into that. But let's learn that when you please Allah, Allah will look after you. Allah will take care of you. When you commit a sin, go back to Allah very quickly. Learn from Musa alayhi salatu was salam. He did something wrong. It wasn't actually a sinful act from an intention of sinning, but rather it was unintended. And yet he says, oh Allah, forgive me. You know what he says? He says, Oh Allah, Oh my Rabb, I have oppressed myself. I have harmed myself. So forgive me. I have done wrong. I have really done wrong against myself. Why do they say, I have wronged against myself? Because the impact of a sin comes back to you, to haunt you. You do something wrong, it will rebound. It has to come back to you. This is why Muhammad sallallahu when he speaks of innovation and bid'ah, what does he say? He says, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa raddun. With someone who does a deed, an act of worship that we have not instructed, it will rebound to them. It will go back to them in sin. They will pay the price of it. They will see how bad it was. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, we've done things that were not right. We have done embarrassing things in the past. What you need to do, what I need to do, turn to Allah. It's not too late yet. We are still breathing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So Musa alayhi salatu was salam, that happened and someone came to him and told him, you know what, they're looking for you and now they want to, you know, perhaps harm you. So he went away. He went away and guess what? He found, according to some of the narrations, a man, a noble man. Some narrations say it was the Prophet Shu'aib, may peace be upon him. And the narrations say that this man was so impressed because of the honesty of Musa alayhi salam. I want to spend a few moments on this because there are lessons for us to learn. Lessons for us to learn from this story. It is reported that when he arrived in Madian, he saw people, all these people were actually, uh, they had their flock, of sheep and whatever livestock they had and they were helping it they were helping the livestock to a drink from the well and there were two women sitting at a bit of a distance and Musa alayhi salam got up to them respectfully and he spoke to them what's wrong with you why are you not going everyone's going you're not going to feed your your sheep or your your livestock and they said la nasqi hatta yusdira Allahu Akbar. That means we will not go to quench the thirst of these, this livestock until the rest of the men move away. Imagine, look at the qualities they have. They're waiting. They know we are women. These are men. You know, we need to, we don't want to actually expose ourselves there. We don't want to make an embarrassment of ourselves there. We'll wait for them to go and then we will come. And our father is an elderly man. Why did they have to say that? Some of the Mufassirin say the reason is, the first question that comes to the mind of the individual is, why are you doing this? There's supposed to be a, a man doing this. So immediately they said, you know what? We know that there's supposed to be a man doing it, but our father is old, so we're doing it on his behalf. It was not wrong. But they showed that there was a need for it. Like what we say, if a woman wants to work, for example, it's not wrong on condition that the environment is good. It's conducive on condition that she knows where to carry, how to carry herself and where to be at what time and so on. If there's a need, there's a need. But where there's no need at all, not at all, nothing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to do the right thing. My brothers and sisters, something we learn beautiful from the story of the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him, is... 
he helped them and in no time he was a strong man the the flock was on its way back home the father inquires what happened they said wow there was a man and they described him and this is what he did he says go and call him they went allah says فَجَاءَتْهُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى اسْتِحْيَاءِ قَالَتْ إِنَّ أَبِي يَدْعُوكَ لِيَجْزِيَكَ أَجْرَ مَا سَقَيْتَ لَنَا One of them came walking very modestly. Very modestly she walked to him and she said, You know, our father is calling you in order to reward you for what you did for us. Wow, subhanallah. The man decided to go. Some of the narrations say, they say that when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam was walking, he decided, you know what? I don't want to walk behind these women. They're going to lead the way. Let me walk in front of them so that they can at least tell me, you know, we're going to the left or to the right and I will carry on. I'm the man and I, I want to lower my gaze, control myself. That was so loved. Subhanallah. It's an act of honesty. It shows dignity. It shows respect. I don't want to abuse. You know, people today, they see a woman and they see her behind. Astaghfirullah. What do they do? Bearded guys. <laughs> Pretend like they're not looking when someone sees them. Astaghfirullah. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Lower your gaze. It brings about nothing but loss of contentment. Loss of contentment. That's not yours. It will never be yours. Yes, it was probably their duty to cover as well from a perspective, from a godly perspective. But if they didn't, you need to do the honorable thing. You need to be respectful. Anyway, this quality was loved by the father as well. You know what he says? He tells the man, look, straight talk. I don't know you or I know you from a different tribe. I know you from a different place altogether. I'm saying this for a reason. Different tribe different place altogether but I offer you one of my daughters wow subhanallah what did the father see the father saw that this man here is honest and he's hard working he might not have anything right now but he's a good man he's responsible he is going to take care of this particular daughter of mine I don't want to lose the opportunity I've got two daughters let me get one of them married subhanallah how many of us think that way a man comes begging for your daughter and you ask him, what do you have? What do you, what do you mean? What do I have? I've got two hands. I've got eyes. I've got no, I mean money, cash. What car do you drive? What job do you have? What's your salary? What's this? What's that? He will, you will tick off the whole list, but he doesn't have Iman. He doesn't have responsibility. He doesn't have good character and conduct. No matter what else he has, your daughter will suffer in that home. But if you have married your daughter off to an honorable person who's responsible, he has character and conduct and he has a, a relationship with his maker, even if he doesn't have all the glamorous things on earth, he's going to look after her like a queen. He's going to look after her better than you can look after the mother of the same child. One day the mother of that same daughter will come back to you and say, I wish you could look after me the way my son-in-law looks after my daughter. I think they would be too scared to say that actually, especially in the Philippines. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you goodness. Look at the lesson. Why does Allah have to make mention of marriage in the middle of the story of Musa alayhi salatu was salam? Because it's important for us to learn a lesson. Don't just read it and carry on. Read it and learn the lesson and apply it as best as you can under the circumstances you live in. Do the honorable. So he says, okay, you work for me for a certain number of years eight years and so on or 10 years and what you do is I give you my daughter and then you can proceed you can go away that shows us something else I think in some cultures they say it is an insult for the son-in-law to come and live with his father-in-law there is a word that they use for it right there is a word they use insult wallahi this is the messenger of Allah higher than you and me one of ulul azmi min rusul one of the determined messengers those with determination they were a specific five top of the notch Highest of the messengers, Musa alayhi salam, one of them. Guess what? <laughs> he worked for his father-in-law. He worked for his father-in-law at a certain stage. That goes to show that sometimes what we believe is actually backward. There's nothing wrong. You're a happy man. I'm a happy man. Work for my father-in-law. So what? I have nothing to lose. Alhamdulillah. Few years he worked and after that he went. Allah gave him prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him after that, 
فلما قضى موسى الأجل وسار بأهله آنس من جانب الطور نارا Allah says after he had completed the period of time with his father-in-law, he went with his spouse, his family members and he was walking in the darkness and he saw a little fire coming from Tur. And what did he do? He told his family, you wait here. I'm going to get some guidance there. I want them to guide me to the path. We seem to be slightly lost here in this darkness. He didn't know that that statement was valid, but from a spiritual perspective. Darkness and yes, there was light coming. And he would get guidance there. When he went, Allah spoke to him. What an honor. Ya Musa, inni ana Allahu rabbul alameen. O Musa, I am Allah, Lord of the worlds. Allah spoke to the Prophet Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Wow. In Surah Taha, Allah speaks of how Allah tells him to remove your shoes. Remove your shoes and come here. Remove your shoes because you are on clean, blessed land. Allahu Akbar. You are in this valley that is sacred. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam obeyed instructions. He received prophethood. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path. The power that the words of Allah have, amazing. The difficulty is with us, we read the word of Allah, but it doesn't impact on us as it should be. We need to cleanse our intentions. Make yourself sincere for the sake of Allah. Take a look at what happened thereafter. Allah tells him, you need to go to the Pharaoh. What? The Pharaoh? You need to go to the Pharaoh, the same man who's been killing people, who's been oppressing, who's been saying, I am the God. Go to him and remind him, tell him, guide him, show him the path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says immediately, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to go to Fir'aun and his people, he says, Qala Rabbi inni akhafu an Oh my Lord, oh my Rabb, I am fearing that they might belie me. Who are they going to listen to? Me? Not me. They won't want to listen to me. They're going to belie me. I'm a weak man. Look at these people. They are powerful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to mention what Musa alayhi salam says. He says, I'm not even eloquent. My chest becomes narrow. You know, you get in our language with us, some people get stage fright. This, is, this does not interpret a stage fright, but it's like a tightening of a chest. And he had a little stammer or stutter. So he says, my tongue doesn't flow. I'm not eloquent. Oh Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him something. He says, oh Allah, I have a brother, elder brother Harun. Someone might ask, how does he have a brother when they were killing? Right? It's a question. According to the narrations, that brother was born in the year that they were not killing because they were killing every second year. That's according to the narrations and that's an acceptable opinion. So what happened is he had an elder brother. So he says, send that brother, send that brother with me. At least we can be two of us. We can go together and do something. And then Allah teaches him something. And he prays. He has a supplication. That is powerful. To this day, we are taught to use the same supplication whenever we are burdened with something and we need to get it done. Something important. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wahlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Oh my Lord, I would like you to do for me the following. Ishrahli sadri. You know, the sadr, the chest that we have. Oh Allah. Strengthen it for me, clear it for me. Make it clear. Instead of being narrow, let it be wider, let it be good. And make my affair easy for me. You have asked me to do something, make it easy. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, Allah asks us to do so many things. How many of us actually say, Oh Allah, make it easy for me. Ya Allah, I need to get up for Salatul Fajr. Ya Allah, make it easy for me. That's something simple. That's not even as big as prophethood, subhanallah. It's just salah. He says, oh Allah, since you've instructed me, I'm going to do it. But make it easy for me. 
And oh Allah, my tongue, clear, clarify it. Open the twist that's on my tongue such that I can speak and they can understand my speech. Sometimes people say things, no one understands what they're saying. Because either the way they talk, the words they choose to use or the way they come across, no one understands them. You know, sometimes when you dial somewhere and a person answers the phone and suddenly you're talking to them and you say hello. That's how we're taught to say because you don't know who's on the other side. Sometimes you say assalamu alaikum and they say uh, they don't even know what you mean. So hello and the guy says, uh, uh, my brother, what language are you speaking? They say, can I please speak to... What did you say? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us speak with eloquence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to open our mouths when they need to be opened and to shut them when they need to be shut. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of this. And Musa alayhi salatu was salam, he then is told by Allah, اِذْهَبَا إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَىٰ Fir'aun has done enough of injustice. He's done a lot of wrong. The two of you go to him and remind him. How should you remind him? Listen very carefully. Another powerful ayah, powerful lesson for all of us. فَقُولَا لَهُ قَوْلَ اللَّيْنَ لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَىٰ Go to him and speak using soft words so that he can remember, he can be reminded or he can be fearful of Allah. The wrath of Allah, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go and speak to him with kind words. Pause for a moment. What lesson do I learn? I am not as good as Musa alayhi salam and no one from amongst us will be as good as him. Agreed? Okay. The people that I will talk to can never be as bad as the Pharaoh and nobody on earth today can be as bad as the Pharaoh because that was Fir'aun. Agreed? But Allah is telling someone better than me to go to someone worse than those whom I go to and still saying, speak to them softly, speak to him calmly, use good words, use a beautiful approach so that he can remember, so that he can come back, so that he can learn a lesson, etc, etc, etc. Who am I to talk to the people whom I'm talking to, to guide them in a harsh way? This is why the lesson for all of us is no matter who you are guiding, no matter who you are teaching, no matter who you are talking to, always remember, use softer words. Use beautiful words. Sadly, a lot of the times it's just talking to your wife or your husband. That's it. You look at him and say, come here. <laughs> come on, relax. There's a way of saying it. My darling, would you like to come on this side here perhaps? There's a way of talking. He'll come running. In fact, there will come a time when if you say it so lovingly, he won't even want you. He won't even wait for you to finish your sentence. You just look at him and he'll run towards you. That's it. Why? Because you have an approach. You have a method. You have a style. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, in our homes, we are suffering because we do not communicate with one another in the proper way. That's why. We want to say something to our children. We are harsh. Your children are not as bad as the Pharaoh and you are not as good as Musa alayhi salam. Speak to them with love, with kindness. They broke the glass. No problem. My son, are you hurt? They broke it again. My son, are you sure you're okay? Try not to do it again. They broke it the third time. My son, are you okay? <laughs> they know. Subhanallah. Three times. It's the third time. Subhanallah. But there is an approach. There is a way to talk to people. There is a way to talk to people to make them feel that they should do what you are asking them to do. Think about it. Apply your mind. Live your life in that way. Like I say, the victims of our abuse are our loved ones. I promise you, the victims of our abuse are more the loved ones. And I call upon the du'at as well. Those who are calling others towards Allah, watch out and be careful. Your word can chase people far away from Allah. Remember that. Sometimes you see a person not dressed appropriately. You see someone perhaps, you know, jumping and, and, and you know, diving with all this music in their ears. Their whole head is actually popping, you know. The whole head is moving and pulsating and so on. I tell you something. If you talk to them, hey, astaghfirullah, and so on. Wallahi, I tell you what's going to happen. The person might look at you and they will go deeper into their sin. Whereas if you look at them, you might want to, you know, 
Maybe not ignore completely, but you might just greet them. Salam alaikum. You know what a lot of the people would do? They would feel embarrassed. They would remove their earplugs. They would actually start walking a little bit straight. Come to you. Salam alaikum. How are you, my brother? And so on. Why? Because of how you spoke to them. That's why. What a powerful lesson. This is from the story of Musa. These are the ayat that we're talking about. When Allah says, Inna fi la ayah, He's speaking about the entire story. Yes. There is a certain point that I will come to towards the end. But I want to drive home this particular point to say, be careful. Even in our Sharia, Allah says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. When you call towards the path of your Rabb, you need to call with wisdom and with beautiful speech. When you debate with people or when you present an argument, present it in the best possible way. ahsan. Use the best examples when you are talking to people. My brothers and sisters, do we promise that we will be more careful of how we use our tongues with our own loved ones? Will, do we promise that? Inshallah. And remember that inshallah needs to be inshallah, not inshallah. You know, inshallah. May Allah forgive us. It's a problem. Wallahi, these are the challenges faced by the ummah. You tell someone something, they say, inshallah, that means I'm not going to do it. It literally means I'm not going to do it. The way you express yourself, but if you say, inshallah, that means I'm definitely moved by this. I will do it. So are we going to do it? Inshallah. Subhanallah. May Allah help me. May Allah guide me. May Allah make me from amongst those who can practice what I've just said. Amin. Amin. So my brothers and sisters, I tell you what a beautiful lesson we learned just from this point. When Musa alayhi salam went to the Pharaoh, and I want to now move on to another point. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam told him whatever he had to, to say, listen, I'm sent by Allah to you. And you know what? You need to worship Allah alone. The Pharaoh could have very easily said, okay, you are right. He could have done that. If he did that, he would have been honorable. He would have achieved his honor, maintained it. He would have been powerful as well. He wouldn't have lost his wealth. He wouldn't have been punished by Allah. But he decided no, because sometimes power and money gets to your head. When you stop seeing color pictures, you only see black and white. Why? Too much money. Money got to your head. Money is not bad. My brothers and sisters, money is good. If you have it, give it to me, inshallah. Money is not bad. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a joke. That was just a joke. Money is not bad, but it is your attitude. If money has changed it and made it bad, then it was bad for you. It's the attitude. There are people who were good before they had money and they are even better after they have had the money. Alhamdulillah. Humble people. They will greet you. You don't even know. Same applies to power, authority and so on. Fame, popularity. It can mess you up. It can destroy you. But if you are humble and you become even more humble, the more Allah blesses you, you are more closer to the ground. Then you have achieved. I always used to say money actually gives you the opportunity to show who you really were all along. That's what it is. So some people were very nice, calm people. When money came and they started becoming harsh, it's because they were always harsh, but they didn't have the opportunity to speak. Like we said, people were just honoring because they were worried about something. But in real life, they didn't want to give that honor. So when they got the money, what happened? It gave them the opportunity to be who they always were. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not do that to us. May we be good all the time. Fir'aun could have said, okay, I accept the message. Why do I say this? Fast forward to some time where there were some magicians called by the Pharaoh. I'm fast forwarding it to learn a lesson. I'm sure you know there were magicians. Do you know which magicians I'm talking about? Yes. Let me tell some of those who didn't say yes. Let me tell you who they were. Okay. They were the magicians when Musa alayhi salatu wasalam showed the Pharaoh the signs that he, he asked for. He said, do you have a sign? He said, yes, I have the signs. One of the signs was when he put his stick down, it became a serpent, a snake that was moving. Pharaoh said, no, I can do that. They are magicians, bring them. So he sent through the whole of the land, bringing thousands of these magicians. They came in. When the magicians came in, what did they do? Remember my brothers and sisters, if Fir'aun was Allah, the magicians would never ask him the following question. What did they say? The magicians said, they looked at him and they said, will we have 
some form of monetary recompense if we win? Did you hear that? Will we have recompense if we win? If we overcome this man, what are we going to get? He says, don't worry, I will give you something good and I will make you close to me. You're going to become a crony as well. If that was Allah, do you, if Fir'aun was Allah, as he claimed, do you really think his subjects would ask him, hey, what are you going to give me? I'm going to do this for you, but what are you going to give me? Astaghfirullah. When people do things for the sake of Allah, they don't ask for money in return. Remember that. They don't ask for money in return. It's not a condition. I can't say, I'm going to come, how much are you going to pay me? What am I doing? I'm speaking about Allah and His Rasul. What do I want? I want Allah to reward me. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make things easy for us. But... When those magicians put down their sticks and their ropes and they, 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 it seemed like these things were moving serpents. Musa alayhi salatu was salam was instructed by Allah not to fear, to put his. When he put the stick, that stick swallowed up everything that was there. Within a split second, all those magicians, without one exception, without a single exception, they fell prostrate for Allah. And they said, we believe in the Lord of Moses and Aaron. Subhanallah. Look at the difference between the Pharaoh and these people. The Pharaoh was given the signs when he saw them. He said, I can challenge this. I, if he wanted, he could have accepted it. When the others saw the signs, they fell prostrate. As soon as they fell prostrate, they just became Muslims. Balik Islam. That's what they called in the Philippines. Balik Islam. That's who they were. Am I right? Yes. Allah loved them so much. How much did they do in, in worship? Nothing. One sajda. They were down in prostration one time. Allah loved them so much and they were so powerful. They were more powerful than Banu Israel because Fir'aun threatened them and said, I'm going to execute you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to cut your hands and your legs. I'm going to do this and that. You know what they said? No problem. Do what you want. You only control a little portion during your little existence in this world. Do what you want. We are going to remain steadfast. Today we have seen something that has convinced us that Allah is one. You are not Allah. My brothers and sisters, the magicians at the time of the Pharaoh, they were forgiven by Allah, granted paradise by one sajda, one prostration. That was accepted by Allah. How many prostrations do you and I do for the sake of Allah? Hundreds, thousands, countless. Ask Allah to accept even one of them. You have won. Ask Allah to accept your prostration. If that is the case, The closest that a slave can be to Allah is when he or she is in prostration. You're close to Allah. Allah loves you. Learn to take your time in sujood, my brothers and sisters. Don't just dart into prostration. The magicians before you did it and Allah loved it. Those magicians were executed. They were punished. They were given a punishment by the Pharaoh. They didn't mind. Do you know what they said? They said, you are just harming us because we are the first of believers. There is nothing we are going to change regarding this new faith of ours. Whenever someone is Balik Islam, there is, which means whenever someone is a new convert to Islam, they will face challenges. Allah is giving you ayat here by telling you, don't worry, everyone who did it before you faced the challenges. Your family might disown you. The other Muslims, the best they could offer you when you declared your shahada was takbir. That's all. After that, they didn't know you and they never were interested in you. They ran away. When they saw you, they said, Balik Islam. When you wanted to marry their daughter, they said, Balik Islam. And they carried on. What a hypocrite. What hypocrisy. Did you hear my point? It is the strongest point I made today. Wallahi. Be careful. Those people are closer to Allah than you and I who were born Muslims. Remember that. And as for the challenge, my beloved Balik Islam, my beloved people who have entered the fold of Islam, remember these verses are specially designed for you by Allah. Allah is telling you, don't worry. You made the right choice. You have to suffer a bit. 
You have to endure. Do people think that it will be enough for them to say, I'm a believer? And you know what? Then they won't be tested. Allah says, we're going to test all of you. My brothers and sisters, I have tears in my eyes because I have met so many revert Muslims who tell me that the Muslims themselves are the ones who treat them bad and rough. And the ones who are racist, the ones who are tribalists, the ones who have all the qualities that Islam does not allow, does not teach what to do. Allahu Akbar. Will we change that? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. If that is the case, we have achieved. Then we have learned these ayat. Why did Allah make mention of the magicians and what happened? For us to be consoled, comforted. Don't worry. Allah loves you. Allah loves you a lot. Allahu Akbar. Allah loves you. Don't worry. The world can talk about you bad. You can lose your job because you decided to put a scarf on your head. So what? Allah says we know there were others who were killed because they accepted Islam. You just lost your job. May Allah not let that happen to us. May Allah test, not test us with tests that are too difficult for us. My brothers and sisters, I want to shift. There is a lot to be said. But obviously, the hour that I have, I will try and mention one more interesting point and then we end at that. The point is, what happened at the end? The Pharaoh decided that no, it's not enough for me just to refuse and reject. I need to follow these guys. I need to punish them. I need to harm them. And he tried so much. And Allah sent them so many plagues. Allah sent them cockroaches. Allah sent them, you know, frogs and so on. Wherever they saw, they were frogs. Wherever they saw, they were cockroaches. They knew it came from Allah. They knew everything. Fir'aun knew exactly everything. And then what happened is, one day Allah instructed Musa alayhi salatu wasalam to go towards the sea and told him, you're going to be followed. Followed by the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh came in. He started following them with all his people. And what happened? They got to the sea. The people of Musa alayhi salam said, you know what? Now we are sandwiched. That's it. There's no hope. He says, It seems like the end of the road, doesn't it? He says, nay, with me is my Lord. He will guide me. Brothers and sisters, how many times in our lives do we feel it's the end of the road? It's not the end of the road. Allah will open the door for you. Allah will guide you. Have trust in Allah. He will show you the path. He will show you the way forward. Don't worry. That's what I learned. The sea is in front of them. The enemy is behind them. And they are standing sandwiched. And Musa alayhi salam is convinced. And he's saying, Kalla, never can Allah let me down. No chance, no ways. So anyway, he was instructed to strike the water with his stick. He struck it and it made 12 highways all going down. As they went down, subhanallah. You know, according to the description of these highways, they were on the seabed, which meant that the water was being held up like, like walls. See the wall on either side. The water was held up. This was water and they went through. The 12 different tribes went straight through. And when the Pharaoh came in, he said, yes, this was done for me, mine, me, me, I'm the one, I'm the God, you know, so on. And he decided to also go in with his people. When he went in and the water started closing in and he looked and he realized, you know what? I'm actually dying now. So he says, he says, I now believe in the one Lord, the Lord of Banu Israel. Why did he not say I believe in God? Because he used to say he is the God. I believe in the God of Moses. I believe in the God of Banu Israel. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, change your lives before it is too late. Don't wait and say, I will change when I'm old because there are so many people in their graves hoping that they changed. They died before they got old. They were all saying we will change when we get old. Allah did not allow them to see old age. So change, change your life today. It's not difficult. Change it today because on that day, Allah tells the Pharaoh, is it now that you want to come to us? 
Yet you were transgressing in the past and you were from amongst those who spread chaos and corruption on earth. Now when you see the angels of death, you want to turn. Nay, not at all. The man was drowned. His body, the sea spat it out so that people could see that the one who used to call himself the God, the powerful, the one who had the money, the one who had everything. Today, when you go to Egypt and you see Ramses II, you won't even want to look at him because he's uglier than the ugliest of those who live on earth. And he used to call himself Ana Rabbukumul A'la. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all powerful lessons. I have said a little bit. May Allah accept it from me. My brothers and sisters, I have become emotional and I'm sure you've witnessed it. It's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.